a short guide to Greek accents, an introductory lesson to get you started on your way to putting accents on the right syllables and to use the right accents when you do. Greek accentuation is pitch-based and tonal and not stress-based as in English. For example, in English, when you say record, you're emphasizing the first syllable. When you say record, you're emphasizing the second syllable by adding stress to it. And notice that the different accents in the English words mean different things. So the words mean different things. There are three accents in Greek. There is what's called the acute, which is a small mark above a vowel that goes from the upper right down to the lower left. This marks a rise in pitch in ancient Greek. The next one is a grav, and it is a mark that goes the opposite direction of the acute, and it denotes a lowering of the pitch in ancient Greek. A circumflex is a mark that sometimes looks like a tilde, as you can see on the screen, but sometimes it looks like a little arc over a vowel as well. The circumflex, it may be worth pointing out, can only be found over a long vowel or a diphthong. So you want to make sure that if you use a circumflex, that it's a long vowel. The key to understanding Greek accentuation is to first know where the Greek word wants to be accented and then follow the rules for that placement. And this will become clear in just a few minutes. The general rule for accents is that verbs are recessive while nouns are persistent. Well, what does that mean? Recessive means that the accent wants to go back as far as possible. That is, as close to the beginning of the word as possible, which in Greek means the third syllable from the end, right? So every verb wants to be accented on the third syllable from the very end. Nouns, on the other hand, are persistent. Wherever the accent is in the nominative, that is the first form you see in a dictionary entry, that's where the accent wants to be. Whether it can stay there is a different question, but for now, just remember, verbs want to be accented on the third from the end, and nouns, wherever they're accented at the beginning, that's where they want to have their accents remain. And again, we'll go over all this in detail. First, we need to talk about syllables. Um, Greek is divided, just like English, uh, into syllables uh, that tend to end with a vowel sound. Um, what this means is that it's an open vowel system. Um, and so when you break a word down into syllables, you're going to make natural breaks after vowels and before consonants, right? There are some exceptions to this, but by and large, this is true. So when you break a word down into syllables, you can remember a basic fact, which is that accents will only be found on the last three syllables of a Greek word. If a Greek word has 17 syllables, and there are in fact some that go that long, um, they're usually made up words in, in comic plays that are based on casseroles with all kinds of vegetables and fish in it. Um, but even if it has 17 syllables, the primary accent, the one that's marked in all Greek, can only be found in the last three syllables. Okay, so you don't have to worry about the rest of the word. There were probably secondary accents, but we don't know what they are um, and we don't mark them. Okay, so let's take a typical word, a word you'll probably see very frequently in the early part of your studies, and that is uh, the verb luomen. Luomen. So the first thing we're gonna do is, is we're gonna break that puppy down into three syllables. So we got lu, a, men. Right, so we have three syllables. Right, the X's above the uh, word uh, show simply the, the last three syllables. And we give each syllable a term. So the last syllable, so we kind of work backwards. So the last syllable of a word, right, at the very end of a word, the last syllable is called the ultima, which means in Latin, the last syllable. All right, moving back one, so in this case, the a, right, the next to last syllable in a word is called the penultima. That is the next to last. And then you go one further back, that is the third from the end. This is where verbs want to be accented, by the way. You have what is called the anti-penultima. That is the syllable before the next to last. So that means the third from 
the end. And I'll be using these terms, ultima, penultima, and antipenultima, quite often throughout um, the lesson. So it may, may be worthwhile for you to pause the video and to uh, think about it, make sure you memorize and understand the concept here. All right, so remember the first thing you have to do is ask yourself, where does the word want to be accented? So let's assume that we know that a Greek word wants to be accented on the antipenultima, that is the third from the end. All verbs are like this. Some nouns are like this. So if you know that the word wants to be accented on the antipenultima, the only accent that can be used is the acute. So you can't put a circumflex or a grave here. It has to be an acute. All right. And the only question you have to ask yourself when you've decided that a word wants to be accented on the antipenultima is whether it wants to stay there or move one forward. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at this word uh, first. Okay, so we have the word luomen, luomen. We have three syllables, right? Lu, a, men. And you'll notice that I've circled the syllable that it wants to be accented. Now, how do we know this? Well, luomen is a verb. It is recessive, which means it wants to be accented on the third syllable from the end right? The antipenultima. Now, normally, right, we would like to say that's it. Let's put an accent there and let's move on with our lives. But you have to check something first, right? You have to ask yourself one question, which is, is the ultima, the last syllable of the word, long or short? Okay, so let's take a look at men, right? Now, you've learned already, I presume, that all epsilons are short, okay? So in this case, if you have a short ultima, the accent can be on the first syllable. So in other words, it goes in the place it wants to be accented. So here we see lu amen, right? So if a word wants to be accented on the antipenultima, it will be if the final vowel is short. I hope that's clear. Right now, let's take a look at an example where it's a little bit more complicated. So this is another verb, right? Again, verbs are uh, recessive, which means they want to be accented on the antipenultima, right? So I've circled in red here the the uh, uh, first syllable ko, right? And that's where it wants to be accented. Now you have to check the last syllable, omega, and if it's long as in the case of omega, because all omegas and etas are long, right? then the accent cannot remain on the ko, where it wants to be, but has to be pushed forward in the word, that is to lu. So the proper accentuation for this word is ko lu o, ko lu o. And that's because in Greek, if you have a long ultima, the furthest back an accent can go is the pen ultima, in this case, lu, all right? So the upshot of this is that if you have a word that wants to be accented on the antipenultima, it will be if the final vowel is short, the ultima is short, but if the ultima is long, you have to push it forward to the penultima. And we'll have some examples in practice at the end of this. Okay, let's move on to a noun. Nouns that uh, are accented on the antipenultima or want to be accented on the antipenultima are virtually verbs. They act just like verbs in terms of accentuation. So let's take a word that you'll see in an early chapter, uh, talata, talata, which means see. Now, how do you know a noun wants to be accented on the antipenultima? Well, if the nominative singular, that is the first form you see in a dictionary entry, is accented on the antipenultima, that's where it wants to be. So because thalata is the first form, we know that this word wants to be accented on the antipenultima. So again, I have circled the first syllable, tha, that's where it wants to be accented. In the second form, thalatan. And so what do you look at? You look at the final syllable, tan, tan. Now in this case, an alpha can be long or it can be short. I'm telling you that the end uh, alpha, tan, is short. 
Therefore, right, the accent remains on the antepenultima, right? Good. Now let's change that form from thalatan with a short alpha at the end to the form thalatais, thalatais, which is uh, ends in a diphthong, alpha iota sigma, right? Alpha iota. This ending is long, right? So even though the word wants to be accented on the tha, it is actually pushed forward and accented on the second alpha, that is the penultima. Just like the verb we saw with luomen and kaluo. Okay, one last time. If a word wants to be accented on the antepenultima, it will be if the final vowel is short. If the final vowel is long, you accent the penultima with an acute. Good. Now let's turn to the next case. Let's assume we know that a word wants to be accented on the penultima. In this case, right, and this is usually a class of nouns, and we'll get to a couple of examples in a second. In this case, only an acute or a circumflex can go here. And remember that you have to have a long vowel uh, for a circumflex to be over it. So if you see a circumflex, you know the vowel is, is long or it's a diphthong in play, right? If the word wants to be accented on the penultima, the accent will stay on the penultima. But the question is, is which accent uh, you're going to put on it. That's the question, right? So you want to focus on which accent because it's not going to move. All right. The simple rule is this. The accent will be acute on the penultima unless you have the following conditions. The penultima is long and the ultima is short. If you have that combination, a long penultima and a short ultima, the penultima will carry a circumflex, it's required. Any other combination, short, long, short, short, you're going to use an acute over the penultima. But remember, if you know the word's gonna be accented on the penultima, it's going to be accented on the penultima. There's one small exception, but we're just gonna like pass over that for the moment. How do you know a word wants to be accented on the penultima? Check the dictionary entry, the very first form. So a couple of early words, Hemera, notice that the accent's of the uh, epsilon, okay? Next word is pule, musa, and hora, okay? So if you look at each of these particular um, words, all right, we can, we can check and see whether or not the rule is in play uh, concerning uh, what kind of accent. So in the first case, hemera, the penultima, mer, has an epsilon, therefore it is short, and the ultima uh, alpha is also short. You do not have long followed by short, so you're gonna have an acute over the penultima. The next word, pule, you have a long final vowel, eta, because all etas are long, therefore the accent over the upsilon must be an acute. The next word, musa, you'll see there's a circumflex over the penultima. All right, so let's check and see if we have the conditions required for it. Is the penultima mu long? Yes, because it's a diphthong. Right? All diphthongs are long. There are a couple more exceptions, but we'll pass over that for the time being. And the final alpha in musa is short. So you have a long penultima, a short ultima, therefore you must place the circumflex over the penultima. And finally, we have the word chora, right? Now, remember, I said that an alpha can be long or short. Using the powers of deduction, you can tell me based on this accent whether or not the alpha is long or short. And the key is, is the accent over the omega. If the final alpha were short, Right, the accent would have to be a circumflex because omega is long, and if the alpha is short, then you have to have a circumflex over the penultima. But in this case, because there is an acute over the omega, you know for a fact that that alpha is long. So hora with a slightly longer hold of that sound. Okay, now 
that's all fine and good. This is how you know what the accent is, and you can kind of tell some things about the word based on that. But let's take a look at um, the paradigm that is a, a declining of the noun musa. And here you see musa, muses, muse, musan, musai, muson, musais, and musas. Now, I put in red the form muson. We'll talk about that form, which looks a little funny. But if you look at the nominative singular, that is the first form, you know that the word wants to be accented on the penultima. Okay, so in the first, in the nominative singular, we have a long vowel, mu, followed by a short alpha, a. Therefore, you have a circumflex. But when you move to the genitive, right, you have the form mu ses. And this is a long vowel, mu, that is diphthong, but the ultima is long, eta. Therefore, the accent over the penultima, where it wants to be accented, is an acute, not a circumflex. The same thing goes for the dative. Mu, long, se, eta with an iota subscript, also long. Therefore, you have to accent the penultima with an acute. When you get to the accusative, Musan, that alpha in the accusative, singular, is short. Therefore, you have the conditions required for a circumflex. A long penultima, mu, followed by a short ultima, sa, san, excuse me. Moving to the nominative plural, we have the form musai. And you have a circumflex over the upsilon, and I promise you I am not making a mistake. There is a rule in Greek that final alpha iota and final omicron iota, so two diphthongs that you would expect to be long, they are actually short. I call these the crazy diphthongs because they don't act like normal diphthongs. So whenever you see um, a word that ends with alpha iota or omicron iota, you know that that is counted short. So we do have the conditions uh, available for a circumflex over the penultima. Long mu, but we have a short, crazy diphthong, alpha iota, therefore we have the circumflex. We'll skip over the genitive plural, but let's take a look at the dative plural, musais, musais. We have a uh, long diphthong, the penultima, mu, and then we have alpha iota, a diphthong followed by a sigma, ice. This is not one of those cases where you have a crazy diphthong because it doesn't end the word. Right, so we have the final sigma changes it. So we have a long followed by a long, therefore the accent must be acute. Finally, in the accusative plural, musas, we have uh, a long penultima, mu, followed by a long alpha in the accusative plural. In the first declension, the accusative plural ending, as, is long. And the only way to remember that is to, well, memorize that. Um, and so in this case, we have mu, a long diphthong in the penultima, but an ultima that is long as, therefore we have an acute. That should become clear. Uh, think about that. Um, and if you just remember that one rule, um, your life will be quite easy. But let's take a look at muson. Why is there a funny accent on muson? Well, it actually follows the rules we just talked about. Um, and it's because the, the form that is written down in classical Attic Greek is actually a contraction of an earlier original that had an extra letter. So the original genitive um, had an alpha in it. So uh, the form would have been musaon, musaon. Word wants to be accented on the mu, right? That's what we talked about. It wants to be accented on the mu. And... So we ask ourselves, right, with three syllables, can it remain there? So what do you do? This is just like the rules of verbs. Look at the final vowel, the ultima, and it's an omega, which is long. So it can't remain there. It must shift forward. So what we have is the form musaon. But when the alpha and uh, omega sit next to each other, there tends to be a contraction involved. And when the contraction involves an accent, so if there's an accent over a vowel that's contracted, it just becomes a circumflex. 
So the final form of the genitive plural, and this is true for every genitive plural in the first declension, there's a circumflex over the ultima. This is the only exception to the rules we've been talking about, but it's based on reasonable um, uh, things. So it's following the rules, but there's been some contraction, which has kind of changed the way that the accent is uh, performing. Now, finally, let's assume that we know a word wants to be accented on the ultima. And this is also true for words that um, are one syllable. So if you have one syllable word and has an accent over it, it, it performs the same way. But let's assume we have a multi-syllable word um, and we know that it wants to be accented on the ultima. If you have an accent on the ultima, right, it can be acute, it can be circumflex, or it can be grave. Some nouns will be accented on the ultima, some pronouns, the definite article will be uh, accented on the ultima because it's a monosyllable, that is a one syllable word. And you can tell again um, where uh, a word wants to be accented by the first uh, entry in the vocabulary. Now, if you know it wants to be accented on the ultima, it will stay on the ultima. And again, the question is, is which accent is to be decided, right? Where does, uh, not where does it go, but which one do we use? And the simple rule is the following. It's based on a pattern and it repeats itself over and over again. An acute will be on the nominative and accusative forms. The circumflex will be on the genitive and dative forms. How do you remember this? Memorize. Okay, let's take a look at a paradigm of this. This is one that's quite uh, familiar, the word time, which means honor, glory, esteem, uh, reputation. You'll notice that the nominative singular time is accented on the ultima. This tells you this word really wants to be accented on the ultima. And the pattern is, as I mentioned, quite simple. If you have a nominative or accusative accent on the ultima, it's going to be an acute. If you have a genitive and dative that's accented on the ultima, it's going to be a circumflex. It's that simple. If you memorize that paradigm, if you know it wants to be on the ultima, you can follow this pattern and find out the answer. Okay, so I told you that if a word is accented on the final syllable, the ultima, it could be an acute, a circumflex, or a grave. So where is the grave accent? You told me it would be. Well, the grave is really an acute in disguise. And the rule is, is if an acute at the end of a word, right, if there's an acute on the end of the word, the ultima, it becomes grave if it's followed by another word. So if you have the word ten, as you can see in the middle of the page, right, with an acute accent, if you put a word after it, for example, stration, the tain acute becomes a grave. Take that phrase, tain stration, but if you add a word after stration, that acute at the end of the word stration becomes a grave, right? So tain stration ek tes choras, you'll notice how that accent changes, right? A final circumflex, so if there's a circumflex on the end of a word, it never changes, it stays the same. It's only an acute that is on the end of a word, that is then followed by another word, it changes and shifts to grave.